Well, unfortunately, you have to follow a, a talk like that. I, I'm going to follow it with a few graphs. So um, that's never been done before, I suspect. Um, this is going to be a double act. Um, Tom is going to shout at me when my time's up. Um, so <coughs> I'm going to talk about yes, climate change and climate adaptation. So basically, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the science of climate change and all of that. Uh, so um, if Nigel Lawson's in the office, in the... Uh, audience, I apologise for that. I'm not going to try and solve that dilemma and assume that people have a vague agreement that there's a relationship between climate change and um, carbon emissions. So we have, we have two challenges as architects. Um, one is mitigation, which is to reduce emissions so that the, the changes that face us in the future will be uh, lessened. Uh, and the other is adaptation, which is to recognise that these changes are underway already, that there are future changes, and we have to design differently. We, so we're, we're designing on the basis of projections rather than past experience, and no one's ever done that before. And there are some things that you can do uh, uh, that will address both agendas, um, but there are some that work in direct opposition. Um, so a classic example is all the schools we've designed recently, you get lots of green points for having lots of daylight, and no one really thinks about the amount of solar gain you get as a consequence. Um, so uh, we have to watch those things and clearly we still have to design beautiful buildings um, because if you design worthy but dull buildings they will be thrown away and worse still if you design uh, unworthy but dull buildings they will certainly be thrown away, dynamited um, so the, the headlines for the UK I think we're all familiar with these what we can expect is hotter, drier summers warmer, wetter winters uh, more extreme events, both in terms of frequency and magnitude, and increasing sea level rise. I won't show you the graph of sea level rise, which is deeply frightening. Um, to get one's head around this, um, I use things like climate analogies, which scientists hate, but I'm going to use it anyway. You could say that the, the climate of London in 2080 might be similar to that of Marseille today, the summertime climate, summertime temperatures. Not everything will be the same, of course, but you can see that's a street in Marseille, and if you look out of the window, uh, you can see the streets here are different, and th that urban form and the lifestyle have grown up together over millennia to fit, and so these houses, the, the streets are narrow, they've got shutters, the siesta, which is, of course, disappearing. Um, these are all mechanisms to cope with, with that particular climate, and we're faced with the challenge of trying to convert a built form that has grown up with, a, with a, an established climate and convert it to a new climate, and no one's done that before. So some things don't change. So things like the midday summer sun angle uh, in Marseille, um, and that's the midday summer sun angle in, in London. So you cannot lift solutions wholesale from one climate and dump them in another. You can learn a hell of a lot. Um, but some things don't change. And again, this is the challenge that we're designing for a climate that no one has, in fact, experienced before. So we have to go back to first principles and understand the building physics to, um, in order to make um, uh, a new architecture. Um, when I did a, the report that um, underpinned the um, Technology Strategy Board um, Design for Future Climate Project, which Irena um, referred to, I sort of broke down the design agenda into just three simple topics, comfort, construction, and water, either too much or too little. When I came to write a book, um, which uh, hopefully Tom will sh uh, plug shamelessly in a moment, um, at the, looking at what had been learned from these, uh, the first tranche of projects, the first 25, there was so much interest in, in comfort as, as the challenge that that took up three chapters rather than one. And I think that's um, it's partly because there's information that you can use to investigate uh, the impact of higher temperatures, um, but also it's a fantastic opportunity to develop a different architecture, to develop um, change in our architecture, so a, a certain degree of fascination with designers. Um, in trying to come up with proposals for all of these, uh, these issues, and there are no solutions, I think that's really important that... Um, People talk about future-proofing buildings, which is just a ridiculous concept because um, <coughs> the thing is we don't know how much it's going to change, we don't know how long it's going to take, so there are no solutions, there are strategies only. But there is a context. Um, 
Well, the first element, I think, is that climate, climate change is a regional issue. The problems that face people in the southeastern corner of this country, in London and in cities particularly, are not the same as those that are, that are faced in rural Scotland. And there are some things that are absolutely fundamental in one place that are uh, you can ignore in others. I live on a hill in Bath. I'm not interested in flooding particularly. Uh, but if I lived in Hull, anyone here from Hull? Oh dear. Right. <laughs> or no, other low-lying uh, places, then, then flooding is, or you live by a river that floods regu regularly, that is an absolute um, uh, focus for your, your, your design. The existing stock is also the, the, the crucial uh, focus really. We will talk about new buildings all the time but actually this is a conversion job and actually any new building is, becomes an existing building rather rapidly and that, will, that too will have to be converted over time. Um, and similarly you can't just throw fossil fuel energy at this problem. You can't just simply say well, well you'll just bung in some more air conditioning because in the future energy will certainly be more expensive, probably scarcer. Um, so we have to be ingenious. We have to use our skills as designers and our understanding of the way buildings work so that most of the job is done by the building, not by the services. Um, there are a number of tactics you can employ. Um, you, there's no need... Um, some things can be just um, dealt with by behavioural change. I mean, for example, uh, when you're designing a building, you, you quite often you look at the worst condition. It's on mid-afternoon in, in, in a hot summer. It's, it's a bit hot, so you put in air conditioning just to solve a four-hour problem on a few days. Um, it'd be much more efficient simply to take the afternoons off. You know, the siesta is a, <laughs> a rather a better concept. So in terms of big interventions that could be made, which would need to be made at a sort of government level, there are things we can do. I mean, we have daylight saving, for example. We could, have a, we could change uh, our working hours and start working earlier in the day when it's cooler. You could take August off, which is what they seem to do in Denmark whenever I want to buy Velfank windows, for example. But you know, there are other solutions. Um, uh, in terms of timing, you don't have to do everything once. If you're, if you're designing a new building, you clearly want to get the foundations right because you don't want to be mucking about digging up and trying to prop up buildings later. But things like um, you know, facade design or um, you know, windows, there are opportunities when the windows need to be replaced in, say, 30 years, um, there are, there's an opportunity to do something at that point to improve the performance of your building when the evidence is clearer. Um, so there are a number of opportunities. And understanding those opportunities, making sure that you don't design them out, is a really important thing. The other thing... Ooh, crikey. Ooh, scale. You don't have to solve everything at the, at the, at the scale of a, an individual building. Some things are better uh, solved at a larger scale. And my, my worry is that we, need, we probably need regulation to do this because at the moment we're being expected to make these decisions on an individual basis and the, the problem's too big. We don't have the information, we don't have the headspace and we don't have the fees to do that. So I, I'm a fascist. I quite like regulation. I have to speak very fast. There's lots of climate information, but it is, it's quite tricky to deal with because it's probabilistic um, and it needs translation. The basic climate information isn't, isn't in the form that we can use as designers. Some of it has been translated, um, and we can use that easily, and there are gaps in the information. I'm going to have to do this really fast. Um, there's a very useful tool coming out from SIBC which looks at, uh, which is a good way of visualising the, the options in, in front of you. If you take something like summer mean daily maximum temperature, um, the baseline level of temperature is that line there, and then for each... Uh, emissions scenario, you can look at how that variable will change through the century. Um, it's probabilistic in nature, so you have a central estimate, a likely range, and a very likely range. So it's very unlikely that the climate will not rise by more than two degrees under that scenario by 2080. And these um, exist for all the, the three scenarios that the UK uh, climate uh, information is presented in. No difference at all in the 2020s. No, so you don't need to worry about choosing a scenario, but there is a difference between the, the past and now. So actually, we certainly shouldn't be designing buildings on the basis of uh, historic data. In a, climate, in, a, in a changing climate, you need to be designing ahead of the curve. A bit of more difference in the 2050s and a considerable difference in the 2080s. So the link to the mitigation agenda 
the more we're successful at mitigation, the less, um, the less far up the curve we'll go. If you take any, it is a moving target. So if you take a, a, a sort of high value early on in the century, it becomes a medium value in the mid-century, and by the end of the century, it's a low value. So my view is one can take a target and just simply see how long that target is valid for through the, through the century. So the only variable is time, uh, so you don't have to worry about all these other complexities. These are the um, climates that were explored by the future climate projects. I'll take away the graph. There's a huge range of people's views on what you should be designing for, and there's no consensus at the moment. We desperately need consensus because otherwise everyone will waste huge amounts of time exploring things they don't need to. Um, that's sort of my view. We should be designing for 2020s now. Um, I like to link these back to global change. So that's a two degree rise, that, that, that line I showed before. So that's, you know, that's what we're trying to keep climate change to. You might go higher, four degrees. If you go above that, four to five degrees, this can turn into a sort of numbers game. You, you, you're playing with the numbers. And actually, above four degrees, you know, London, New York, Tokyo, are threatened. So actually the world will be a very, very different place under those circumstances. That's it. Over to you. Um, this is one of my favourite films. It's, it's from Brazil and it, it kind of highlights one of the, the strategy to get rid of uh, sort of overheating in spaces. There's big problems with chucking more M&E, of course, into buildings, volatile um, price index of commodities that they rely on. And people don't, don't like M&E. We found from uh, speaking to occupants that, that they, they inherently don't trust all these amazing systems. I, I really like this slide. Again, another shot from Brazil where you have a vigilante HVAC engineer um, who is in a full SAS kit. And it's kind of, this is how I think clients feel how uh, sort of much of a, a bespoke profession this has become and then there's a sort of deep mistrust in, in, their, in between their eyes that I think is quite pertinent and relevant. Um, very quickly, this is, is from a survey that we undertook on one of these studies that I'm going to try and present, although I may only do one. Um, interestingly, 65% uh, of, of staff are keen to get the control back to them so that, you know, it's simple as opening a window rather than having everything done automated. And of course, there is an answer to, to a lot of these problems, which is nat to naturally ventilate buildings. Alongside that, I think we have a responsibility as architects to refurbish uh, buildings. Insane volumes of um, carbon uh, will be in a building like this. Um, I think it's Lacaton and Vassal uh, office in Paris. And I think, oh yeah, it's come in on, on thingies. Um, but that's not always possible. Um, so this is one of our projects in which the client was very keen on, on insulating and refurbishing and going down an advent strategy, but it's listed, it's in a conservation area, so there's a limit sometimes to what you can, what you can do. Um, some of these things are coming in in the wrong order because I've put them on together in a Mac and I think it's not talking quite right. But some of the things that Bill's touched on is that, that climate is changing rapidly. The building sectors and facilities management are not predicting the changes. They're, they're just responding to what's currently happening. And quite often that is a replace on a like-for-like -like kind of basis. Um, and it can cause more problems in the future. Um, this is one of the case studies that I'm quickly hoping to talk about. It's um, a building in church view. On the right-hand side uh, is a series of overheating, um, which is the other thing I'm only going to talk about is overheating. Overheating data, um, in this case over 28. I think the point essentially to make is that a lot of the spaces behave very, very differently. And there's no one side, uh, one kind of fix that uh, uh, you can apply across the, the whole building. The other thing that is definitely worth touching on is that an incremental approach we feel is a lot more beneficial um, because it gives a lot more flexibility in the future and it will cost you a lot of money, a lot less money. There's no point in putting in all singing, all dancing windows now if they're not going to work, um, well, they're not going to have a lifespan that's going to take them to 2080 when they're designed to work for. Um, I think I'll only present one, one study, actually, just because I'm already up on time. But 
essentially what the way that we've approached this problem with TSB is to look at a series of, of, of adaptations on a room by room basis and then you see how effective different adaptations are. Um, there are huge variants in, in what is effective in different spaces. The assumptions that you make in order to get this data are absolutely crucial. The weather data you use that Bill's already touched on can have profound effects. How you measure comfort, again, can have profound effects. And then the, in the intention, having worked out which uh, interventions are best for which spaces, we then stack them on top of each other using, in this case, um, a comfort threshold that predicts human uh, ability to adapt to it and build up a strategy for, for, for different spaces that involves different interventions at different stages. Now, there are loads of advantages of this. Um, in the first instance, it's found to be a lot cheaper to go down this route. Big savings in the case of this building, about 3.7 million. Hugely important for facilities management and building users who then get to understand when rooms need upgrading potentially. They can use data that they collect from those rooms to see how true they are to behaving to the model. Gives them miles more flexibility and they're not putting in things that they don't need to now. Um, I won't touch this entire project because we're already overdone. Um, only to say that I think in the future the adaptations that, that, that buildings will need, certainly by the time we get to 2050, if we're retrofitting buildings, there is going to be um, kind of a physical effect that that is going to have on our environment, either by insulating and, and putting double sets of cavities on the outside of buildings is going to have an effect on the public space, or by eating into the buildings, if you put another, another layer, there's an effect on how those buildings are used. This doesn't necessarily mean it's all bad. This is a kind of Frank Lloyd Wright and Blade Runner um, shot, which is trying to show that louvers everywhere, might there might actually be some potential for a bit of beauty um, within that. And now, this is a book that I haven't read, but I've heard on great authority uh, that it is exceptionally good, and I would urge you all to purchase very many copies. And I think that's all we've kind of got time for, I'm afraid. So.